Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So when I first set out to write this sermon, I was going to start with a funny story about the gong show, because in our epistle lesson we have Paul teaching us the importance of the love of Jesus Christ that, that needs to be intertwined into every part of our life. And he gives an example, and he says, you can be the greatest speaker in the world, but if you don't have love, you're nothing but a noisy gong. So the gong show, and I entitled my sermon, This Isn't the Gong Show. But then something happened. Among other things, um, the governor of New York passed the law, and you, I'm sure you've heard this, making abortion up to the time of birth much easier and more convenient. And now the governors of Virginia and Vermont and Illinois are, are looking to follow suit and even make looser laws than that. And if the mother says that the baby will create a hardship and, and, and she can define what hardship is, that that child can be aborted even up to the point of birth and according to some of the language floating around uh, even after the, shortly after the child is born. When this news came from New York, they lit up Freedom Tower in the color of pink in celebration. The irony of that should hit you in the face. On 9-11, which the Freedom Tower was, was built to commemorate, terrorists killed some 3,500 people, husbands and wives, sons and daughters. In fact, as Pastor O'Donnell pointed out last night, and I, I looked it up, among the names of those we lost are 11 unborn children named. Great contributors to society and future contributors, human beings. The outcry for justice was great. The cry of pain was heard through the nation. If you were alive when this happened, you remember it. 3,500 souls. What a loss it was. Well, the lives of 4,000 unborn babies are being taken every day. And with these new laws, that number is only going to increase. Needless to say, I scrapped my other sermon and I wrote a new one. And you won't find any jokes in this one. But you will find hope. I'm not going to talk politics, but I am going to talk human nature. Because this goes so much further than taking the life of an unborn human. It opens the door to the abuse of all human life. Assisted suicide, euthanasia, aborting the disabled, population control. I mean, do you understand the uh, slippery slope we are on? When you don't value one life, all life is at risk. When you start killing people because they might be an inconvenience or they don't fit the mold of what a government thinks is right or useful, all life is at risk. But the truth of Scripture, God's Word tells us that life is a gift, that it's sacred. By the way, this, as I mentioned in, in the welcome, this is Sanctity of Life Sunday, where we celebrate and we focus on this gift of life. So the new title of my sermon is Created in God's Image, the Sanctity of Life. And that is what I want to talk about this morning. We know the gruesome details and realities of this, so let's go in the right direction and talk about the hope. God created you as a person. All humans are people, and that sounds like a funny statement, but society needs to understand that, that humans are different and more valuable than the animals. Genesis chapter 1. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Nothing else is created in God's image. 
Not only that, but we are also God's representatives here on earth. We are to be good stewards over his creation. We're not to abuse the animals or the environment. We are, we are supposed to use them for our survival and our enjoyment. Be thankful for what we have and not waste our blessings, and that certainly includes human life. This is why God says, be fruitful and multiply. Now you need to understand something. The devil, the father of all lies, takes what God has done and he does the opposite. God says, fill the earth with human life. The devil wants the opposite. He wants the destruction of life. The devil is the great deceiver. So we have to stand our ground and speak the truth. All life is sacred. Scripture can't be any more clear that life starts at conception, and not only that, but there's purpose for each and every life. Verses 4 and 5 from our Old Testament lesson. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Not only does God literally form and create us in the womb, just like he created Adam from the ground, not only the physical creation, but who we are and what he has planned for us. Which goes back to last week's sermon where we are all created different, but we are all part of the body of Christ, with Jesus as the head, created for a purpose to do our part. Now, it's up to God how the individual plays their part. God works through people. Many times we don't even realize he's working through us, but he is. And it is all to preserve life, to save the lost, and to grow his kingdom. It all comes down to God's love for each and every one of you. His love is, is why he created you. And when we messed up, he continued to love us so much that he sent his son to die for us. He rose him from the dead to, be, to defeat sin and death. He didn't do this for any other living thing. So for us to destroy what he sent his son to save is a sin. Now one thing that I certainly want to acknowledge, though, is, is that I understand and I'm well aware of the fact that, that some of you have been closely affected by abortion. Your story is unique and painful, I'm sure. So please understand that there is forgiveness of sin. Jesus died for all sin. But trust me, the devil gets involved in this too. He, he tries to spin the truth that you can't be forgiven for such a thing. Remember, he is a liar. The words of 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 comfort us. He says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He heals you. You're not alone. The Lord is with you. Repent and receive the forgiveness that was won for everyone on the cross. You may be asking, what can I do? And again, I'm not covering any politics here. That's up to you how you vote and what you publicly support and don't support. Political pressure sometimes works, but only when the culture changes. So there are things you can do to lead by Christian example to change the culture, showing and giving the love of Christ, which Paul wrote about in our epistle lesson. First, if you know anyone personally affected by abortion or is considering it, be a Christian friend. Love them, listen to them, pray with them, get them help if they need any, and that includes Christian counsel. Another way is adoption. Adoption is an incredible gift you can give. Some parents feel they can't raise their child but would be happy and grateful to have a loving couple step in. See, it comes down to options. When a pregnant woman thinks that abortion is the only option, that is what she does. But if she knew there were other options and she was supported and loved, she would gladly choose life. 
A good example of this is a place called a place of refuge, and this is a crisis pregnancy shelter, and it's also a ministry arm of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, which provides an alternative to abortion. It's amazing how many pregnant women do want their baby to live, but they feel backed into a corner that they have no choice. A place of refuge gives them an option. They will house the expectant mother. They will give her food. They, were, they will help her get the medical service she needs. They will help her get, to, get her to work or get a job or train her or lead her to volunteer work, be with her at the birth of her child and help her after the child is born. In addition to the many babies who have been saved through this ministry, it is a Christian shelter teaching the good news of Jesus Christ. Here, too, is found the love of Christ that Paul talks about. So many mothers have been brought to faith and many babies have been baptized at a place of refuge because of this ministry. Please consider supporting Christian ministries like it. At the end of this service, we will have a door offering and all the money will go to a place of refuge. There's so many ways you can help and that is what is going to change the tide. It will change the culture of this. And of course, please pray. That is the most important thing. Pray for our lawmakers. Pray for the unborn and the parents. Pray for life at every stage. It is the most important thing because with God, all things are possible. Now to close, let me emphasize a few things. And the Lutheran Study Bible really puts this beautifully, so some of the language I use is from there. First Psalm 139 verses 13 and 14. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. You are handmade by God. Everyone is. Whether you're an embryo growing in a womb, a young man in his prime, or a grandma laying in a nursing home bed, Every human life has this God-given value. Second, God redeemed human life. God loved what he created so much that he sent his son to pay the price, to buy all human life back from sin and death, not with money but with the precious blood of Christ. The hands that knit you together in your mother's womb were stretched out on a cross, they were pierced with nails and bled the cleansing blood of forgiveness. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The embryo in the petri dish, the child with, with Down syndrome that hasn't been born yet, the young woman with brain damage, the, the elderly man with Alzheimer's have all been bought with a price. And that price gives them value regardless of their stage of development or condition. Finally, God gives special value to those he calls his own. God's grace given in baptism flows to the weak as well as to the healthy. The little girl with special needs is as much a child of God as the pastor who baptizes her. Value comes from what God is able to do in and through his children, not from the capabilities of his children. Believing any other way minimizes God's power. All people are worthy of life because God makes it so. He created life. You and every life have handmade value. God redeemed life with his outstretched hands. You and every life have been bought with a price. If life is not the goal, why did God raise Jesus from the dead? God's power is at work in those he calls his own. You and every child of God are instruments of his power. Thank God for the gift of life. Thank God for the value he gives every life. We pray. Heavenly Father, you are creator of all and the giver of life. 
You have created humankind in your image to reflect your glory to the world, and we praise you for the work your hands have done. We pray today that you would breathe new life into us. We pray you would increase our empathy, compassion, and love for our neighbors, no matter their age, race, ability, background, or need. We pray we would be people whose hearts echo your own heart for your people. Help us to be champions of life. Strengthen us and equip us to do your work in our communities, our nations, and our world. May we stand for what you have taught us, and may we give you glory in all that we do. It is in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll now have the gathering of our offerings. <laughs>